Um, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. That's Dr. Jacob Jule. And Jacob is a cognitive neuroscientist at the Department of Experimental Psychology of the University of Groningen. He got his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Amsterdam again, working with Victor Lama, who's quite well known for his work on consciousness. And the PhD was on conscious and un unconscious visual processing in early visual uh, processes. And he also did postdocs abroad with similar materialistic approaches to investigating how the brain produces consciousness. Until that is, he came to the conclusion that it doesn't. Um, that and that there has to be more to an explanation of it. He then started doing parapsychological research, I think, uh, you know, out of the mainstream view, and he wrote a book uh, that's unfortunately only available in Dutch with the title Wat is bewustzijn nou eigenlijk, which means what is consciousness really? And it includes the beginnings of his own theory of consciousness as, or as a dimension in the physical universe. So the title of his talk is Higher Dimensions of Consciousness. Jacob, looking forward to it. The floor is yours. Well, thank you and, and thanks for having me. Um, really great speakers thus far and I hope I can contribute something uh, as well. Um, on the one hand, unfortunately that Eric could not join us for the remainder of the session. On the other hand, I'm going to talk a lot about physics as a non-physicist, so it reduces my stress a little bit. Um, let me share my screen with you so that we can um, start the presentation. And I hope that you have my presentation now. Uh, that one. Okay. Wonderful. So um, let me play the presentation and there we are. So um, today I'm going to talk about this idea that developed during the writing of my book, What is Consciousness Really? And to be fairly honest, it's the most silly idea that I uh, could think of, but it works. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how consciousness relates to natural science. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this idea about consciousness as a separate dimension. Um, but I'm also I'm going to try to spend a little bit of time on coming from theory to an actual prediction. Now, um, are you seeing my full image or my uh, my speaker's notes? If full image, full image. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. Um, so let us first uh, uh, talk a little bit about what we mean with consciousness. But the thing is. If we talk about consciousness, many people mean many different things. Um, in my thinking, in my academic upbringing, uh, I've been taught to think about consciousness purely as what we call qualia or experiences. So what are we talking about then? Well, I'm presenting a red square over here. Um, if we talk about qualia or about experiences, it's really about the redness of the square. Actually, this is not a red square at all. This is just a bunch of photons hitting your retinas, triggering biochemical processes, subsequently triggering neural activity. But that particular neural activity has a particular feel to it. You experience something. And it's those experiences that we're talking about mostly in the scientific literature on consciousness. So even though all these discussions about ego, the feeling of a self, um, all these things that we associate with consciousness are vitally important for our human being. The core, the pure essence of, of consciousness is this awareness, this experience, this qualitative experience. And this is what I will be talking about when I talk about consciousness. Well, is this important? Well, actually, it is. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, a paper appeared from a group of experimental philosophers who asked uh, research participants a question about a conscious or supposedly conscious robot. And actually, it comes quite directly from uh, one of my favorite science fiction series, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, that series actually featured an episode in which one of the main characters, an intelligent android, Data, it's the character in white over here, um, Data is an extremely complicated and sophisticated android. Uh, he's so sophisticated that he actually functions as a human being. Um, he responds as a human being in many uh, circumstances. But Data does not have conscious experiences or he does not have qualia. Now, in this study by Seitzma et al., these experimental philosophers, they asked two groups of participants to read a story about a data-like uh, android. So the story went like this. 
In the year 21XX, we have developed a robot that is so complex you can't really distinguish it from human. It acts like human, it looks like human, and if you ask it, are you human, it will tell you, yes, I am human. However, the robot does not have conscious experiences. Another group was given pretty much the same story, and that story read, in 21XS, we have developed a very complicated uh, humanoid robot. You can't distinguish it from an actual human. It uh, speaks like a human, looks like a human. And this robot is so sophisticated, it actually does have conscious experiences. So it does have these qualia. Now, both of these groups were asked the question, would you assign this robot human rights? Now, the interesting thing is, by far most of the respondents in the group who got uh, read the story about the robot without conscious experiences, they actually said, well, it might look like a human, it might act like a human, but it doesn't have conscious experiences, so we don't have to give it human rights. Whereas the people in the other group, uh, the majority, the vast majority said, well, it looks like a human, it acts like a human, and it has conscious experiences, so we should give it human rights. Now, this does tell you that this notion of conscious experience regardless of any kind of further complexity, this notion of conscious experience is really important to us if we try to understand consciousness. So that is what I'm going to, to talk about and look at in, in the remainder of this lecture. So purely experience. So I'm, I'm going to let go about more complex notions of consciousness and focusing purely on conscious experience. Now, I've been brought up in a, uh, a strictly materialist reductionist uh, setting um, and, and that's also the way of thinking I've been trained in and uh, that, that's something that's very difficult to let go of. But basically what we are trying to do as natural scientists, um, scientists who want to understand how the world works and how consciousness fit in, is basically that we try to find a place for consciousness in our physical description of the world. And I've illustrated that physical uh, picture of the world here by means of a nice uh, illustration of Bob Ross. Um, basically, this is a nice metaphor of how the universe works. So we have a canvas, which is space-time, and space-time is basically a big container for all these elemental particles, which what Ross here has on his uh, uh, artist's board, but are basically the pigments that are on the canvas. Now, these pigments are moved in rather particular ways. Now, in most of Ross's paintings, you can kind of predict that it will be a landscape, and every now and then you have an unpredictable tree or happy cloud. Uh, suppose that I wouldn't have used Bob Ross, but... Uh, Jackson Pollock, it would be random splatters, and if it would be Hank Helmont, or a very famous Dutch painter, it would be exact, uh, very exact uh, still lives. But uh, anyway, this is a nice metaphor for uh, um, how we think about uh, um, how particles are uh, uh, um, sort of put on the canvas. We have canvas, the canvas, space time, we've got elementary particles on there, the pigments in the paint, and these pigments in the paint are moved around according to specific laws. Now, not saying or trying to imply that these laws of physics have any kind of teleology, that there is a kind of supernatural painter painting uh, these particles on the canvas of space time. Uh, these laws of physics can be completely, we can be completely agnostic about them. But when talking about uh, where should we put consciousness in our natural science picture of the world? I think it's a useful metaphor because it can make us think a bit about, well, where would you try to find consciousness? Where would you find to uh, try to, to find these qualitative experiences? Because somehow these qualitative experiences, the feeling of red, the feeling of warmth, the feeling of cold, they should have a place somewhere within this particular setting, within the setting of either in space-time, either in the configuration of particles, or maybe emerging from the laws of physics, which is kind of what I tried to represent here. So it could be that consciousness is somewhere on the artist's palette. It could be that it's somewhere emergent from the laws of physics. It could be that it's somewhere within space-time. But actually, most of the time, we think about consciousness as being emergent, uh, it's a property of the actual picture that has been put on the canvas. But anyway, the big question is, where do we fit in this idea of the redness of red, the warmth of a cup of coffee? 
Now, in contemporary psychology, um, we pretty much teach our students this. Minds are simply what brains do. And actually, this is such pervasive in the study of psychology is that it actually in our introductory psychology textbooks. I've been teaching introduction psychology uh, for, for over five or six years at the University of Groningen. And um, actually, in, in, in the Gazanica textbook, it basically says consciousness is the experience that's the product of brain activity. Now, of course, the latter is a big assumption, but this is what we have been training generations of psychology students and neuroscientists. The uh, claim minds are simply what brains do is, of course, a logical one. Uh, if you look at most mainstream uh, uh, ideas about consciousness, it basically states that consciousness is a brain process. Now, in my metaphor about the universe as being a painting by Bob Ross, it would basically say that we think of consciousness as an emergent property. Consciousness exists because of a very particular configuration of the particles on the canvas or in space time. So essentially consciousness just comes about because, well, particles are arranged in a particular way. There is a particular picture on the canvas and that is consciousness. Now, we have heard a lot about emergent properties already in the previous two talks, and um, there is, of course, a lot to say for this idea that consciousness indeed is an emergent phenomenon. However, the problem with emergence is that you also stumble into some problems with regard to what is then an emergent property. And actually, quite nicely, uh, that's illustrated by the paradox of Theseus' ship. And this is actually an interesting picture. This is uh, uh, a picture I took from the Lego's idea, uh, Ideas website. So Lego has this uh, a competition where you can send in an idea for a new Lego set. And this is, if it gets accepted, the first philosophy themed Lego set there is. It's a representation of the ship of Theseus. Uh, Theseus is a Greek classical hero. He went from Athens to Crete. And in this version of the story, a coin by Aristotle, um, Theseus leaves in a ship that's in a rather deplorable state. Uh, actually, it's so bad that during his voyage, uh, Theseus has to replace several of the boards of the ship. Um, at some point during the voyage, he even has to replace the entire sail, and this goes on and on. And by the time that Theseus returns from Crete in Athens, he actually has replaced every single board there is on his ship uh, and also fitted new sail. Now the question is, does Theseus arrive on the same ship or is this a different ship? And this is a, a very famous paradox in, in philosophy because you can answer this in two ways. You can say, well, no, it's not really the same ship because every single element of the ship has been replaced. You could also say, well, it's still the same ship because it's Theseus' ship. Um, and even though he has replaced some things, the basic thing is still there. And now you might think, okay, uh, if, if both of these are correct, then there must be something wrong. And indeed it is. If you look at the phenomenon of emergence and the phenomenon of, of um, the idea that, that, that one question can have two answers that are equally valid, it very often means that something in your assumptions or in your deduction has gone astray. And in this case, Aristotle solved this particular paradox by stating that, well, the question, is this still Theseus ship, is basically a wrong question because we have not properly defined what Theseus ship is. So if we think of Theseus ship as the original ship he left on, then of course it's not Theseus ship because the elements have changed. This is a different ship. Think of the band, the Sugar Babes. Uh, it's a girl group which has been uh, uh, well, three girls. And over the past 20 years, uh, each of the individual girls has been replaced. Is this still the same band? Well, from a certain point of view, yes, because the management still books the master sugar babes but the interesting thing is the three original singers have now regrouped as the original sugar babes and um so the question is to which concert do you go if you want to see the sugar babes well it depends on your definition of well what the real sugar babes are and similar thing for theseus ship it depends a bit on your definition what theseus ship is 
Now, why am I telling this? Because this actually is a, a line of reasoning that goes for many emergent properties. An emergent property is very often dependent on the level of the observer. Uh, an emergent property is a way to describe the state of the world in a more efficient way. As Professor Vlinder called this as a reduction of information. Now, the difficult thing with information is that it very often implies a kind of intentional agent. You have to do something with information as an observer or as an agent. Now, in physics, they're quite agnostic to this, but in terms of, of thinking about consciousness, you very often and very quickly get into these difficult issues about agency, the role of the observer, etc. So the problem with the entire issue of emergence is that, yes, properties might emerge from lower level features, but they require an observer. There's always a kind of hidden element of, of well, an intentional agent who has to observe a system to make a property emerge. And the problem, of course, is if we're talking about consciousness, if we're talking about the idea of self-consciousness, who or what is then observing the world so that my consciousness can emerge? Now, there are many different ideas about that, including the idea that it might be some kind of strange loop in which I observe or my consciousness observes uh, itself. Um, but I always find these uh, discussions a bit difficult and in particular because the concept of emergence or the idea of the mind as an emergent property of brain activity is uh, very often uh, uh, well, rather poorly specified. When does something emerge? How complex does a brain have to be in order to have something emerge? Now, there are some ideas about that, for example, integrated information theory, but these ideas are typically uh, um, rather poorly specified. However, being a brain scientist and having been brought up in this idea that mind is what the brain does, let us continue a little bit along that line of reasoning. So I have brought here a picture of a brain. I have brought here a representation of the retinas of red, and somehow these two are related. Now, they're not the same, and that's the reason why I am not uh, using the equal sign here, but rather the equivalent sign. But the big problem that we're trying to solve in contemporary cognitive neuroscience is which brain states are equivalent to what particular qualitative states or experience states. Now, interestingly, and this is something that we have heard in, in the previous talks, also the talks of, of uh, last Tuesday, is that one of those particular brain states is the state of feeling a self. So the idea that, that, that my brain state, that my experiential states are mine, the idea that when I experience something, that it's my experience, that agency or the ownership of an experience, that in and by itself is also an experience. So interestingly, uh, by thinking about sort of the brain as the basis of all these qualitative experiences, um, we kind of limit our thinking about what these qualitative states are. There's always a self, there's always an ego associated with these particular conscious states. Um, it's also the reason that we as brain scientists have been looking in the brain because we have an individual brain associated with individual states. So somehow that relation must be there. Now, one of the things that really struck me uh, over the past couple of years, and one of the things that was very nicely confirmed in Tuesday's talks about meditation, is that this idea of, of an ego, a feeling of ownership of particular experiences, um, is not as universal as we typically think. And I've re represented that over here in a couple of ex uh, examples. So um, what we see over here on the background, I have this idea of a self. And on the left, you can see a representation of something that's called depersonalization. It's, it's a clinical symptom. It's the uh, uh, phenomenon that your experiences are not really yours anymore, that you are uh, uh, basically just a, a, um, a spectator on all the things that are happening to you. You lose the feeling of agency. And interestingly, this is an aspect that we see quite often in people who meditate very regularly but are not properly trained or, or uh, um, supervised in, in sort of the early stages of meditation. 
actually the entire idea of depersonalization or, or reducing this feeling of an ego associated with awareness and experience is actually one of the core goals of some forms of meditation so last tuesday we had a very interesting talk by helene slachter about this idea of pure awareness in meditation so the idea that if you practice non-dual meditation that you can achieve a state where there's pure awareness and no longer the feeling of an ego and that's quite interesting because this is quite widely reported. It is a very nice counterexample to the idea that conscious experiences always need to have a specific feeling of ownership. However, uh, however there, there are other examples uh, in, in literature where we can look at dissociations between qualia, experiences and the self. Now, in the middle, I have brought a picture of a uh, disorder called body integrity identity disorder. It's a very peculiar disorder where patients uh, misinterpret signals coming from their own body and can't properly integrate it into the, the representation of their body. So being a cognitive neuroscientist, I, I like to talk about brain areas. Now, we know that there is a particular brain area that represents your body. You have a kind of online uh, a representation of where your body is in space. Sometimes the representation goes astray and it means that signals coming in from, let's say, your hand are not properly processed and are not integrated into this body image. And that leads to very odd and weird distortions. So these people uh, um, experience their arm as not being their own, leading to very uh, uh, unpleasant sensations. Now, very often this disorder can only be cured or, or, or the, these problems can only be alleviated by amputation of limbs. So not seldomly you see these people going on to uh, self-amputation. Now, it's another example that a qualitative experience does not always end up with the proper owner. Now, finally, I have a picture from the documentary Twin Life. Uh, Twin Life is a, a two-hour documentary about a very rare case of conjoined twins, uh, the Hogan twins in, in Canada. Um, they are joined at the head and they share a particular part of the brain called the thalamus. It's one of the parts of the brain that integrates visual or, or sensory information. Uh, it's a subcortical uh, nucleus. It integrates information before it enters all these specialized parts of the brain that process vision or, or touch or uh, hearing. Now, as you can see, physically, these twins are not capable of each looking the same way. But... Interestingly, if one of the twins sees something, for example, she's looking at a TV show and something funny, the other twin will start laughing. Both of these twins have access to each other's visual experiences or even their gustatory experiences, but they very well know that it's not their own experience that they are experiencing. So here we have another example where qualia experiences, experiences generate one body, are somehow ending up at a different self. So what I propose is that we should basically let go of the idea that we are sort of making this equivalence between an individual brain state and an individual conscious state. Maybe what we ought to do is talk about consciousness or think about consciousness in uh, terms of more universal thing maybe if we want to put consciousness somewhere or give it a place somewhere within this framework of physics we should not think about individual brain states and individual conscious states but maybe we should think in a bit more general terms and talk about the state of the universe as a whole and conscious states as a whole so let's get rid of this idea of that conscious experience always should have an owner but let's put it in uh, 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 this perspective that we look at conscious states directly coupled to at physical states. Now, the difficult thing is where then do we put these conscious states in our model of the universe? What I've got on screen over here is a nice picture of the uh, standard model of physics, which Eric uh, uh, already introduced. Now, one of the issues is that we don't really have a place or a fundamental place for consciousness over here. Now, I've also already discussed that, that emergence comes with its own challenges, if you want to put it there. So one of the issues, if we want to put consciousness at the level of particles or even the laws of physics, we are very quickly uh, confined to the idea that it needs to be a kind of emergent phenomenon. 
And that's difficult because emergence kind of requires this intentional observer. Now, logically, if we want to put consciousness somewhere in this physical model, and I need to emphasize it might be that that's the wrong place to put consciousness, but let's suppose that we want to do that. Um, there's only one place we can logically uh, uh, put consciousness, and that is in the fabric of space-time. Now, here, this is where things get a bit weird and uh, 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 difficult, possibly. But logically speaking, if we want to introduce consciousness somewhere in this physical model, and we want to have it as a kind of fundamental and not emergent property of our physical universe, there's only one place that we can logically introduce consciousness or, or fumbling consciousness, and that is in the fabric of space-time. So the proposal that I came up with together with Bernard Carr um, is that we should think of consciousness as a dimension. Uh, so here I have a representation of the three spatial dimensions. If we have a particle P in, in space, then we describe that with coordinates X, Y, and Z. Basically, the idea is to extend this X, Y, and Z space, or basically the X, Y, Z, and T space, um, with another space, uh, which we might call a consciousness space. And the idea is this consciousness space is organized um, in a kind of topological or semantic way. Conscious experiences that are like each other, for example, the experience of blue, are close to the qualia of green, and they are close to the qualia of, uh, um, or if, if I'm thinking about, for example, auditory qualia, the qualitative experience of hearing the C4 on a piano is quite close to hearing the C4 on a guitar. So the idea is we have a consciousness space where all these different uh, uh, qualitative elements are together. So that means that we have to, uh, uh, if we want to describe the position of a particle in space, uh, particle R, we can't suffice with stating X, Y, and Z. We have to expand that coordinate with a coordinate Q. Now, I'm not going to speculate about where this dimension comes from or, or, or what the ontology is. or um, I'm just going to go with this idea now that there might be a, a place for these conscious sensations as a separate dimension. Now, the thing is, I should not cheat then, because if we look at the, the behavior of particles at the subatomic level, we know that these particles um, are governed by the laws of quantum physics. Now, to cut a very long story short, um, in quantum physics, we know that particles don't have a definite position. Uh, actually, if you talk about the position of a particle in quantum physics, you actually talk about probability distributions. And this is where things get interesting, because it means that if you take consciousness as a separate dimension, so we introduce this coordinate Q for conscious sensations as well, it means that we also have to talk about the probability of finding uh, a particular particle at a conscious at a particular uh, um, position in this consciousness space. Now, given uh, 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 the time, I'm going to skip through a couple of things here. But the most important takeaway from this particular idea is that whereas we typically think um, in in brain sciences or materialist consciousness science about uh, conscious experiences and particular brain states being exactly the same, this particular model actually states something slightly different. Namely, if you have one particular brain state, it could be as uh, associated with different conscious states. However, there's a most likely one, but there's a kind of continuum there. So there is a probability relation between my brain state or the state of the universe and a particular uh, particular con uh, conscious sensation that goes along with it. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the physics parts over here. Um, but the uh, um, model basically states um, what happens during uh, 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 the time, uh, what, what happens is that we have a kind of evolution of the universe. Uh, you can think of that as a what's called a brain. Uh, it's, it's a brain that moves through space time. And with every tick of a kind of cosmic clock, particles are sort of fixed on that particular canvas. And 
if these particles get their definitive position, they're also assigned a particular position in consciousness space. But this relation between the physical state of the universe and, and where and, and, and what kind of conscious sensations end up associated with that is not completely fixed. It's not completely uh, um, uh, governed by what we might call the laws of physics. Now, and that's interesting because it leads us to uh, being able to do particular predictions about what might happen. So I'm going to show you some data of uh, an experiment we did uh, two years ago just to illustrate this uh, particular point. Um, but let me first uh, 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 re reiterate the, the, the most important uh, aspect over here. So basically what we're saying is that each particle, um, let's say the particles of my brain, they're moving through space time. At the moment, they are sort of quite uh, uh, close, uh, uh, quite at the same uh, uh, position. They're just moving through time. And every tick of a kind of cosmic clock, they also get assigned a definitive position associated with particular qualia. Now, in this qualia space, qualia or experiences that look like each other are close together. And it's quite interesting because it means that we as an audience also have our qualia quite cl uh, close together in this qualia space because we're all kind of looking at the same slide at the moment. Uh, so that's interesting because even though the particles of our brains are physically at different places, they are at quite the same place within this qualia space. So there is a kind of connection over here. Now, it also means that given that the relation between positions in qualia space and actual physical space is not a uh, is equal relation, as in the normal idea that mind is what the brain does, but it's a, a, a probability relation, it might mean that if a lot of us or a lot of particles are at the same place in, 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 in this qualia space, it might be that some odd mix-ups happen. Um, now, when does that happen? Well, in particular, if many experiences are synchronized. And this is an experiment that, that, that's basically um, inspired by uh, the Global Consciousness Project of, of, of Roger Nelson. Uh, basically, Nelson's uh, uh, Global Consciousness Project is a project in which he uh, has a lot of random number generators. These are, are devices that produce random numbers. Uh, he, these are all over the world. And he looks at the randomness in that particular network of, of random number generators. And a typical finding is that the moment that a lot of people report the same sensation because something happens in the world, the randomness in the network decreases. Now, interestingly, uh, something similar happens at music festivals. Dean Radin did an experiment at the American Music Festival Burning Man. Um, and at Burning Man, uh, the festival ends with, with, with well, literally the Burning Man. And a network of number generators there uh, also showed a decrease in randomness. So a synchronization of consciousness, a lot of people being at the same queue space actually did something weird with physical devices uh, in and around the festival. And that's quite interesting because it kind of fits this model. So we did this experiment at Lowlands a Dutch Music Festival two years ago. We had a nice uh, number generator there, and I can tell you all about that in the panel discussion later on. But the most important thing uh, I want to show you is here. Um, what you see over here is a graphical depiction of the results that we have over here. And I'd like you to look at the, the blue line. The blue line is here the deviation of randomness from this particular number generator. And whenever it crosses one of these solid lines, then it means that number generator is not behaving as it should. It is producing a lot of regular sequences. And interestingly, this is exactly what we find at the Lowlands Festival. Um, even though it's not during the entire festival, we see quite a long episodes where the behavior of the uh, generator is not random. Now, is this a music festival related thing? Well, might be because a very similar generator which we kept in Groningen did not do anything at all. Um, there's a little bit more to it uh, to, uh, with this experiment than, than I have time to tell you about, but I would like to end with uh, um, a nice, uh, 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 maybe a bit deeper uh, uh, discussion about analytical psychology uh, in, in terms of this model. It might sound like a big jump from uh, 
quantum physics and a separate dimension and 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 talking about uh, uh, weird things going on in music festivals to analytical psychology but actually there's a very deep link because the model i presented here is uh, in fact conceptually very close to an idea that has been proposed uh, decades ago already by Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung called the Unus Mundus model, um, where they also describe the universe in terms of a kind of qualitative or more conscious-like uh, dimension versus a physical dimension. And um, I think that it would be uh, better to leave the rest of that discussion for the uh, questions and the panel discussion. Um, I, I'd like to leave it at that, uh, Sarah. Is that okay? Yes, that's <laughs> fine. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, okay, we have just a couple of minutes for questions. One thing I wanted to add at the end of, <laughs> if I can just ask one very short question. Pauli, uh, anecdotally, apparently, whenever he walked into a lab with uh, electrical equipment, he tended to sh short out the whole lab and um, things would misfunction. Do you relate that to this? You know, his consciousness was doing something to the machines. Do you think that fits with the theory? Yes, it's it's a it's a very nice example of synchronicity. It's, yeah. it's one of the reasons he actually got in touch with Jung in the first place. Um, but yes, I do think that this is a a, a very related phenomenon. Synchronicity is, an, uh, I think, an example where you have events in physical space um, kind of happening uh, because of a connection in, in this more qualitative space. So, yeah, one of the nice things is that, like I said, we are quite close together now in this qualitative yeah. space, uh, even though we're not close together in physical space. And I do think that that, that okay. closeness in qualitative space can have an effect on physical space. Thank you. We have an interesting viewer question too uh, from Hans. He says, would a different way to put your theory be space-time emerges within consciousness in line with Donald Hoffman's notion of space-time being a dashboard, a headset? What do you think of that? Um, let, me, let, 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 let me think. So, yes, you could probably uh, uh, in, interpret it uh, uh, like that. So one of the, the main questions here, can you indeed see a, a consciousness as an element of, of space-time, so a dimension within space-time, or is space-time emergent from consciousness? Now, there... Uh, uh, um, yeah, the, the, those are basically the two things that I, that that you you have to weigh up uh, uh, to each other. I one of the difficulties uh, uh, with sort of the idea of, of space time emerging from consciousness is that you are again dealing with this phenomenon of emergence. Um, yeah. So let me give this a bit more thought and I come back to this in the panel discussion. Okay, sounds good. Um, one last question from uh, Bernardo. Does qualia space underlie space-time bijectively? And if so, shouldn't my qualia change when I move in space? Uh, yes, your qualia should change if you move in space. That's the, uh, yeah. th that, that's the idea. So the idea is if I go outside, then my qualia will be different for the simple reason that my sensory input is, is different. Am I not if I'm blind and I'm not yeah. So if, uh, but what about if you um, couldn't actually see the outside world? So if you were blind and you know you were lost in thought, quite often when I walk mm -hmm. out of my office, I'm so caught up in my thoughts that I'm really not. My qualia are very much involved with the thought pattern yeah. rather than the uh, the uh, the exterior. I mean. Yeah, so no, that, that would be indeed be a, a, a situation where you have a small movement in qualia space and a relatively large movement in, in physical space. So they're not completely, uh, um, uh, there's not a one-on-one -on -one relation uh, in, in, in that sense. The different laws governing movement through qualia space, which are closely related to sort of the, the laws of uh, well, psychophysics in, in a way, I think that's a very nice example. Uh, um, for example, the Weber law is, is a uh, effect of Weber law is a quite nice demonstration where a, a physical uh, movement in physical space or, or a physical quantity does not one on one relate to a travel in, in, in qualitative space. So okay. I, I think that, that there's not necessarily one on one relation. There. Okay.